My name is Joe Bessiker, and I do this uh, a lot, <coughs> different schools around the area, outside the area. Next week, I'll be out in California, they asked me to speak at UC Cal Irvine. And what I like to try to do is tell you what you guys want to hear. Uh, I speak all the time, so uh, I do have a PowerPoint. I never run the clicker, but I will give you some background information just to, to try anyway. Okay, what'd that do? This way? So we were incorporated in 1991. I started the firm. Uh, this is an old slide. I think we're right now around 5.5 billion. So what we do is we're a small, we're, we manage all types of assets, but the primary amount of what we do is uh, small and mid cap. Does everybody here understand cap size and, and what, what we're talking about there? Uh, I'm gonna pick on this third girl here. Do you know what uh, small cap means? Okay. So when you look at what the market capitalization or what a company is worth, Tesla, Apple, Nvidia, IBM, Merck, they're big caps. They, they, their market capitalization, what they're worth, their stock is worth, can be, you know, I think Apple's over a trillion now. Uh, currently, the, what we manage is to a benchmark, which is called the Russell 2000. We look at the smaller 2,000 publicly traded companies in the market. We also do mid. So um, a company has to have, when I first started, a small cap was 500 million or less. It's now about 4 billion. That's, that's the top end of the small cap range. Although we can invest in companies that have 20 or 30 million dollar market cap. Uh, that's kind of what we do. And that's where the growth engine of what's going on uh, in the market and in the United States is, is concerned. More jobs are created in the small companies than in the big companies, but as an aggregate. So, and how do we do that? Um, we believe that the low end of the market is extremely inefficient. Uh, large cap companies like Apple have you know, maybe 60 analysts, 50 analysts. A company like, uh, I told you, Tesla, um, I don't know, 40 analysts. Uh, but when you get down to our range, typically there's two or fewer Wall Street analysts. And even those analysts don't really follow them that much because there's not a lot of investment banking dollars to be gained by doing that research. So it makes it a very inefficient frontier and it gives people like us the opportunity. We make over 2,000 company visits a year and we not only meet those companies, but we talk to their uh, competitors, suppliers, vendors, distributors. And that gives us a pretty good idea of what's going on, not only in that company, but in the sectors that we're looking at. I have 22 analysts. They, as I said, make over 2,000 company visits a year, kicking the tires, kind of seeing what's out there, and really getting a fundamental bottom-up approach as to what we think is going on in the marketplace today. We do not really rely on outside research. So Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, uh, Raymond James, all these companies are good companies that give good research, but it's not the type of research really we, we really want. We like to originate our research. We manage money all over uh, the country. As I said, um, I'm going out next week, Tuesday night, <coughs> to Los Angeles. We manage money for LA Power and Water. Then I'm getting on a plane and going up and see Contra Costa County. Uh, we manage money, a lot of money, because we started in Pennsylvania. A lot of Pennsylvania for the state itself, but all the others, endowments. Um, this is just a representative sample. Um, some of our money we manage is inside other companies, inside their other portfolios, so Prudential and Principal. And um, I can honestly tell you that, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not going to be uh, humble about it, 
we're probably, if not the, we're one of the, the best small cap managers in the country. So, and we have representation all over. I'm going to just talk about this advantage, but I'm going to get back to it on, on the bigger talk. And you can tell me when I, if you can give me like a 10 minute heads up, somebody when, when the time's going on. What time are we supposed to be done? No? Okay. Um, and this really goes to something that I want to talk about, the five Ps. It's really three Ps for me. I believe in life, everything, everything business related, and even outside. So uh, we're working with, if anybody's driven by on Oregon Pike, our foundation building now, which used to be the old communi Jewish Community Center in Lancaster. Uh, I believe in the three Ps, and we've added the other things. I believe in all business. If you have the right process, and that process is something that you yourself or your team, whoever that team may be, could be your brother, your sister, your parents, your cohort, your college buddy, you got to develop a process. You have to have a concept of what you're doing in business and why you want to do it. So once you get that down, all right, the next important thing is the people, all right? The people that you get beside you are the most critical part of these five Ps because business is a diff business is war. You, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat every day. Uh, people are obviously competitors and, and people that are constantly telling you no. Um, you have to have people next to you that have, share the same vision with you all right, and are going to try to execute that. And you're constantly going to be running into uh, hurdles and when we're a research analyst, we're looking to get uh, to understand that company's process and then judging to see if the people can do that. If those two things work, and you get to the persistence there, but it, I, I cut that out. If those two things work, you'll get performance. So if you have the right process, you have the right people, you'll get performance. Now, it doesn't come overnight. And you have to sometimes tinker with your process, and you have to add and subtract people. But it's just like anything, whether it be sports, whether it be in music, art, theater. You know, the thing is, is that you have, the right, have to have the right people to execute a plan. And that plan is your process. And that process you need to do over a period of time to really, as I said, try to get a vision as to what you're trying to accomplish. Can you... Can you um, communicate that process. Sometimes people have it up here and they want to tell everybody everything and you can't do that because people have ADD. It's worse today. You guys all seem to be paying pretty much attention but trust me when we're going out to give presentations or we're trying to sell our concepts you get very little time to hook them. So you have to be succinct and uh, that's where you really have to know your process and be able to get the bullet points of why it's important. Explain to people that you're talking to in your business that it's not just about you, it's about the people and how they're going to execute. And in doing that, they'll buy in and that will help your, your, your performance. And I'll get into that more a little bit. This is our team, part of our team. Uh, some of you have met and seen some of these people. They're, uh, Primarily concentrated here in Lancaster, but we have offices in uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, out in San Diego, and in Cleveland, and a small office in Florida. This is the most important thing we do. This is our Bible. This is our 10-step research. Anybody? It's on the damn slide. Our 10-step research... Remember I told you about process? So if I don't have a lot of time, I can, if I have a lot of time, we can go this in depth. If I don't have a lot of time, I can just show this slide and say, this is what differentiates us from our competition. This is what makes us different. This is what we do on a daily basis. And this is how you should come to know us. So if they have a lot of time, we go through step one, step two, step three, and we tell stories about these things. If not, like now, I'll tell you how we do this. So we review when we, when we go every day. This is what we do every day. 
we review like everybody else. You get on Google, you look them up, okay, and we look at the SEC filings, press releases, news stories. What we find and how we've really executed on that is we like to go to local business newspapers that follow these companies a little bit more because these aren't typically names that will be written up by the big Wall Street names. And we really try to immerse ourselves in their information. The most important thing we do is meet with management. When you look at real estate, real estate is about what? What's the most important thing in real estate? There you go. And what do they say? Location, location, location. So in this world that we live in, it's about management, management, management. It's that people of the process. And we tend to follow management around if they were one place and then maybe another place. Uh, we tend to see when we find good management, we fall in love. Because I would rather have great management in a bad widget than a great widget or a great software or great whatever with bad management. Management wins the day. Then once we meet with that management, we kick the tires, we see them, we see what's going on. And as I said, how many visits do we make a year? Who said that? All right, you get a prize at the end of this. All right? We make over 2,000 company visits a year, and then what do we do? We talk to their customers. We want to see if they're happy. What are the critical factors for their decision? Uh, the likelihood of getting repeat business. Then we talk to their competitors. Uh, you got an Eagles jersey on. That means you're a good guy. So wh why do you think we talk to their competitors? You're not sure? Well, one of the reasons we talk to their competitors is because they're usually in the same business and we want to learn about the business. But they'll typically tell you things that they believe the other company has deficiencies in, what their faults are, all right? And we try to get both sides of the story. So we want to hear what the other side is saying. You know, when you're talking to, if I would go see Coke, I'd like to see what Pepsi says about their business and how that's going. Uh, so something like that. We then talk to their suppliers. We want to see their ability to supply the product and the services required for that company and if there's any supply chain bottlenecks. Then we talk to distributors, and they're the people that can tell us, you know, how the channel is working, the inventories, the demand in the channel. It isn't till that time, it isn't till we gather all this information, till we then develop our own model and our own report. Okay, we, that's when we, because if you get, if you, if you just start to do a report, it's out of context. You need to create context to understand and that's why you put then the financial evaluations model. Now, a lot of people think when they come to work with us or intern with us that uh, third party research, oh, look at these great reports that all these big firms do. Well, my view of those big firms is what I've told my kids since they were little. I, I have four kids. Uh, I, we go on trips, and most of them are business trips, and then we do stuff after. So if I go to New York, LA or Chicago or Boston and they were with me I'd show them those big buildings up there and they'd have big you know the big names all of them see this you know the big the big powerhouse names and I say you see them up there we kick their ass because we do and how do we kick their ass we kick their ass by doing this process because they don't do this this is too much work they, they don't have enough time they have the money but they have to see how that works this is our model, and it works for us because this is all we do. They have all other reasons to do it, and what they do is kind of maintenance research. We look to originate, and we look to find disruptive companies through that. But at that point, once we get our report, we want to see what other people are saying. We might have missed something. We may have. But I don't want to look at it before because I don't want that to influence our original thinking. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to be like the other lemmings on Wall Street. So what we want to do is encourage original thought and then have a check and balance. And then at times, we'll interview those other analysts and say, okay, why did you see these things this way? And you'll find often they don't have a good argument. All right? It's just because it was thrown on their desk by their boss and they had to follow this sector and they haven't probably seen them. We, we, have a comp we had a company that was one of our huge winners. Uh, it was a pet company that did veterinary pet supplies, MWI Pharma, and uh, MWV Pharma, I'm sorry. They were in Boise, Idaho. And they went public 
eight years before we saw them. And they, when we went there, <laughs> they had, it's nice, they had a board like this and Welcome Emerald, and they actually put a little red carpet out for us and stuff, and we thought, wow, this is pretty cool. And they said, well, this is special to us because while we go out and we see analysts all the time, you're the first people that have ever been here since our IPO, ever. And guess what? I usually have this chart in this presentation. The stock from when we got involved, I can only tell you that it was a 30-bagger, and it was worth the chip trip to Boise, Idaho. All right? And that's how, and we got to know. And why was that even more inefficient? Because the analysts that were following it were traditional healthcare analysts. So this is a vet company. They're looking at biotech. They're looking at, and they're not really paying attention to this. Hugely inefficient opportunity. And as they started to grow and acquire and do things, this stock literally till it got taken over was a 30-fold from our initial position. That's 30 times, 30 times, all right? For every company, and I have, uh, I don't know if I brought them, I hope I did. Uh, I was running today. Uh, I've been running a lot, and I really want to make this interactive at the end, and I'll kind of get into why. And there's a lot more people here than I thought, too. I'm glad I did extra. But uh, I don't have it. We publish an internal report for every name, whether we buy it or not. Because what we want is a starting point. We want to be able, first of all, I have 22 analysts. I have seven <coughs> portfolio managers. If we're making how many visits a year? Over 2,000, right. That's a lot of information to disseminate. Now, back when we first started, there wasn't all of these good things that we have in the internet and the ways to be able to communicate. But those are okay. You know, the emails and all that stuff. Are, but if I told you how many emails I got a day, you, you, I don't think you'd be surprised, but I get nearly 900 emails a day. 900 emails a day. A, so somebody says you sent me an email, I say, oh, thanks a lot. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't cut the mustard for me. It has to be shepherded to me. So the idea of uh, it gets down to that last and the most important thing in our business, in your schooling, in your family, in anything you do in life is the 10 step. And my kids are tired of hearing it. Because when we have an issue, I say, you have a 10 step problem here. Um, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. You guys need to be communicating with your teachers because oftentimes you guys all have the talent. You have all the intellect, you're here. But a lot of times there's a gap in communication and the way you mess up, you didn't remember this about that, you didn't remember that. Communication is the most important thing I could try, one of the most important things, I could, and it's hard. It's hard work, it's hard in marriage, all right? You know, marriage, when you guys will find out when you get married, that's the problem. You still love each other, you still like to be with each other, but where the breakdowns come is communication. And that's something we gotta work on every day. So, uh, and, I'm as guilty as anybody, but when we, we grade our analysts and our portfolio managers on a quarterly basis, quarterly. Anybody want to know why we do that? Do you guys remember exactly what you were doing last February? Last January? There's a gap. I mean, you say, I think it was, whatever. We like to keep that window tight when we give grades so that if there's a problem, and we're not communicating or they're not seeing enough companies or something, we can catch it before it becomes a big problem. And we bonus quarterly because heaven forbid, let's say you go through the year and you're having a good year and then one of your names blows up in uh, December 15th. What is that portfolio manager naturally gonna kind of remember when he's grading you? The crappy stock, all right? So the idea is just don't let that communication lag go too long. And that's in everything we're going to talk about today. Communication is, and, and look, we're communicating now. Your school is giving you an opportunity to communicate with the business world in ways that many other schools don't. And I'm always impressed by the kids that, are in the, that I talk to here and your teachers that want to continue this. It's not just me. I saw your series. And, you know, what I try to do and what I'm going to try to do is impart one or two or three things that tangibly you can take with you and think about to improve your life and to improve your situation. This step 10 is one of them, okay? All the other steps are what we do, but step 10 is a very important thing in your, in your life. Um, 
I also believe, who watched the debates the other night by show of hands? The Democratic debate. Come on, somebody had to. None of you watched the Democratic debate? Not a one? You did. I'm not going to get into politics, all right? I'd love to, but I'm not going to. Why do you think Bernie Sanders continues to do well? Other than the fact that people, not, not the fact that people would say on either side he wants to give stuff away, this and that. Because, and I, do you want to take a guess? He, yeah, but what about his talking a lot? Well, I'm not sure I love his personality, but that's part of it. He does have personalities. I, he's constant, he looks like a man that's in constant need of an enema, but that's a different story for a different time. He is, if you see him Monday, if you see him Friday, if you see him four months ago, if you see him next month, he has a message. Whether you like the message, that's not my point. Unlike some other people up there, he pounds his message home. You're not going to miss anything if you see him, if you missed him on Monday and you, and you saw him on Wednesday. It's going to be the same thing. And it's not talking points from him. He's passionately speaking about the things that he truly believes in. I personally don't believe in a lot of what he believes in. But I admire his tenacity and his messaging. And what you have to do in business and in life with your teachers, with your parents, with your friends, with your potential places you work, you have to market yourself. You have to be your own best advocate. Because the truth is, you may think other people have your back, and many people do, but you have to be your own best advocate. And what does that mean then? You have to let people know what you're interested in, what your passions are, what your beliefs are, encapsulate them and let people know. Now, everywhere I go, you'll rarely see me without this on my body. And next week, I'm going to a conference at Raymond James, the, the first week of March. And we'll have eight people there. Every one of us, we're like a clothing store. Every one of us, and I can't tell you how many times, hundreds of times, people have noticed that, man, there's one of the Emerald Group, all right? And that stands for something. And then when they say, I tell them what it stands for, all right? And then people start to understand and understand you're not just another player on Wall Street, which is very busy. These guys do what they do, like Bernie Sanders. They may not like it, but at least we tell people what we're doing and why we're doing it. From our work at Emerald, when we make over 2,000 company visits a year, we make over 2,000 company visits a year, we make over 2,000 company visits a year. Here at Emerald, we do 2,000 company visits. If we make over 2,000 company visits a year, Get it? <laughs> I get on TV. They don't even know I'm doing it. I'm basically telling people what Emerald does. Now, I don't have the time to explain why, but people are smart enough to understand that. They know that people don't do that. All right? Not one time have I had a producer. And I could do 30 more of those, all right, because I do a lot of TV and radio. I chose times where I was wearing a tie and when I wasn't. Most of the time, you'll see, I have almost knives and I have my stuff on. So as people and kids in school, you know the worst thing is I said to my son, who's just started the first year at St. Joe's, I was talking to him last night at dinner. He basically said, this professor, he went and asked, because I told you we're going away in a couple days, in a couple weeks, could he leave? He has never missed a class. Could he skip this, take his test early so he could leave? And the thing is, he said, well, the teacher doesn't really know him. That's a mistake. You have to take ownership of your own brand. You have to, you don't have to be, you don't have to kiss up, you don't have to kiss your, 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 your teacher's butt, all right? But you ha they have to know who you are and what you're about and why. And if you don't like something in their class, you have to figure out a way to be able to communicate that as well because that's just as important as when you have a teacher and you say we love you because that teacher should get that input. 
that teacher should see that for the four years they've been teaching the class like crap and nobody had the temerity to tell them. Now there's ways of doing it, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it, but so when you're communicating you have to, com the inventory, the good and the bad. And that means you gotta be prepared, you just don't wing it, all right? And that's why I do that every time, all right? And so I go back to the three Ps. Now, I don't have a hard copy of it, so I don't know what's next, and I'll just get into it. But the three Ps in your life should be important as well. I live everything in life, so as according to the three Ps. And, my, uh, I, and all these things are things I'm telling you, but my poor kids have had to listen to this for forever. I have four, four and they're now all four teenagers. And what I tell them is, in school, that's part of the two Ps, the second P. It's the people. It's who you hang with, it's who you are with, all right, that really is who you are. And no matter, you know, that's very important. So uh, you've heard it probably from your parents and all that type of thing, but it's real life. And people judge you in the business world and in real life by the company you keep, all right? Now, you know, I've had some success in my life, but I still hang with my boys, all right? Some of the biggest knuckleheads you ever want to see, but why? All right, and I don't shield them from these other people because they have the qualities, even though they're knuckleheads, they have the qualities that I like to see in people. They're loyal, they're honest, they'll have your back, they'll tell me when I'm screwing up, as opposed to as you start to do well in life, you get people that are sycophants and just kind of tell you you're great, but maybe you're messing up. So I don't shield them at all, and I have funny stories to tell. I will tell this story. So we have, <laughs> we have an award at our Groundhog Day. By the way, that's the other thing. We do an investment conference. We're Pennsylvania-based around Groundhog Day. All right, why do we do that? Well, it's a Pennsylvania thing, right? Right? People outside, and it's a way to brand, to get something differentiated in people's brain. And I remember when I first came up with the idea almost 30 years ago, and I went to my team and I said, this is what I think we do. They said, let me get this straight. You want to do a conference in February in Philadelphia in the middle of the winter. And it wasn't Philly. The first one we did was right in Harrisburg. I said, yeah. I said, because at the time, we, when we started our money management firm, we started concentrating this style in Pennsylvania-based companies, all right? Because I had to get a hook. Otherwise, I was competing. So I went to Pennsylvania municipalities, Pennsylvania, invest back in your own state, invest back in your own workers, invest back in your own people, all right? I guess I didn't pay a bill. It's actually my wife, but I should turn it off. I'm sorry. So um, now I lost my train of thought. Where was I? I was talking about the, the, pardon me? Yeah, well, what it is, is you have to have a hook in everything, in, in all the things you do. And I have, we haven't changed any, oh, but we have this conference. I was telling you about my knucklehead buddies. So we have this conference, and at the conference we give out awards. We give it the best technology company, best overall company, and we give out five awards. And one of them, that we started 12 years ago by my, before it was cool, we gave out a green award. We gave out, Emerald Green, get it? But, but uh, we gave out a green award for the company that was showed the most social responsibility in the area of being green and, and, and that type of thing. And this particular year, we gave out the award to Under Armour. Does anybody know why we gave it to Under Armour? Somebody should. They were the first people to do this, all right? What they did, because they are socially conscious, what they did is they took all these plastic bottles, spun them down, and they made new material out of them and made shirts that were made out of water bottles, made gear that was made out of water bottles. And guess what? They were able to sell it for more than what they could sell regular gear. Because green business could be green sometimes. So anyway, Convince them, they come down, they're getting the award. Now, fortunately, we usually do it at lunch, but we did it after the cocktail hour because they couldn't come till later. 
and one of my knucklehead buddies was there. And I'll just cut to the chase. I won't go through it. So we have, give out this award. They're really happy. We're really happy. He decides after six glasses of wine he was going to photobomb the thing. All right? Now, to this day, it's one of the most hilarious things because there's these real serious people, and he's back behind. You know, he went to the stage to do that. So I talked to the CFO. He said, what was that all about? I said, and he said, well, why is this guy here? You know, because he's not an investment guy. And I said, because he's my friend. And because he does invest and whatever. But this is a guy who, through life, if I called him right now and I were in Pittsburgh and my car broke down, I know that he'd get in a car and drive. He'd drop everything and drive down. So you have to choose your friends and the people you associate with really well. And that's the people part of it. Now, the process part. Has anybody by a show of hands here thought, you guys are all thinking, right? Starting their own business. Starting an idea, a concept. That's it? Just you guys? Anybody else up here? All right. I would encourage it, even if it fails. It is the most, and I think if you watch Bloomberg the other day, the only good moment he had was when he looked down and he says, I'm the only one that ever started a business to any of you. Starting a business is the most humbling thing in the world because you realize <laughs> you think you know stuff, but very rapidly you know very little. All right? So you then have to go back and hone your process and figure out the things you don't know and incorporate them into that process. And even if it's an online thing where you're blogging or selling something, I would encourage you as a group to talk to each other. Maybe you have an idea. I have, uh, the problem is I have zillions of ideas. That's a, it's a curse and a blessing, all right? Especially when I see all these companies. I think, you know, I'll give you one. I'll give you one I just had a couple days ago. Um, my brother-in-law works for Stoner, Stoner uh, uh, glass cleaner. Anybody hear of it? They're, they're Quarryville based uh, and he's their head of sales. And they have these little uh, wipes that are the best wipes in the world for all this stuff. They're just phenomenal. They clean it up. They, it makes it slick. It's certain. It's a high-end polymer. It was invented by a NASA guy. And so I called him up the other day and I said, hey, does your, do your wipes have disinfectant properties? He says, yeah, they're phenomenal. But we would have to spend a lot of money to get that stamp of approval to say that it does. And they like to sell in bulk to Walmart and whatever. And they just, they're doing fine. So that, but I thought, man, well, how cool would it be to have them private label this for me? I would label it as something and spend the money to get that kind of verification, that validation. Because in this day and age, I mean, I go to a consumer electronics show or big shows like that, people are germaphobes. And the biggest way of spreading germs isn't shaking somebody's hands, this. This is a filthy, filthy, filthy thing. I don't even want to get as gross with you, but, you know, I read a study of how many people take this to the bathroom with them, you know? So, but I thought, wouldn't that be cool if you just repurposed it, have the brand be for it would still do all the same great things, but have the brand be for safety and, and for, you know, uh, keeping uh, spread of germs. And one of the things you, I just need to know, if you wear Clorox or Lysol on your phone, that breaks down the phone. That's the, it, it breaks down the screen and stuff. So it's not, a, but this thing you can do with the mind. So what would I do? If I were in that case, I had this idea. What would I do? If I had this concept, which I had, what do you think I should do? Pardon me? All right. well, first of all, I w well, I think I found it, because I found that. What, what, once you have all that down, what do you think I should do? Correct. 100%, you get an A. That process is doing more work to find out about the market, look to see who the competitors, the suppliers, the vendors, the distributors are. I got some of that down. I then have to look at the capital needs and exactly what I'd have to look to see what the marketing needs are, how I would do this, would I do guerrilla marketing, would it be digital marketing? All of that process ha you have to undergo. And how are you gonna do that? You're one person. You gotta get people. 
Now, are they going to be your partners? Are you going to outsource that? What's that going to cost? Well, once you lock those two things down, you can start to execute and hopefully you'll get performance. And it, 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 it's in all of life, those two things, that process. People don't think about process enough. They do. Or they do what they're told. That's not always the best thing. And as you go forward in life and as you start to learn about business, process is very important, but not as important as people. Uh, these are the things we do. We do our growth fund, which is one of the, one of the biggest award winning. Uh, just on January 8th, Yahoo Finance, Zacks, named us as one of the three, uh, exactly what they said, um, one of the three funds that they, re they would re uh, recommend for the magnificent retirement mutual fund list. Okay? That's quite an accomplishment for a Leola, Pennsylvania. We got lots of these. I just, this is the most current. This is long term. They look short term, mid term, long term. And what else do they look at? Somebody. Pretty easy. They look at the process. They want to see if it's a process that makes sense, that's reproducible, if there's a way, and not just somebody that got lucky or, you know, or worse. Let's say you have a genius that manages it, one guy, one lady. All right? And this lady is doing great for four or five years. No team, it's just her. What's your risk there? Exactly. She gets hit by the proverbial bus. Things happen. So now you're left with what? No process. No people behind it. So as a, as a consultant or somebody that picks these things, that's very important. Does the team, is there something behind that where we help that be reproducible? And then we built ours to scale and that is something that we have all the time. We have a banking and finance fund, which I won't spend a lot of time, but we've won tons of awards for that. We have what's called an insights fund, which is kind of an all cap. I told you we don't do at all small mid cap. This is an all cap. We do great with that. Our small cap value fund is struggling a little bit right now because if you understand the markets, this has been uh, eight years where value stocks have woefully underperformed growth stocks. And they usually go in cycles, but not this long. And we think it's going to change, but uh, we still undergo the process and we do what we do there. We have a brand new fund that just came out. It's called, our, it's an income fund because people want income. And this is based off the income that comes off the master limited partnerships is transportation and oil. They're not an oil drilling company. They're, they're just a toll taker. They have these pipes. Whatever gets pumped through, there's a toll on it, and that's what it does. So, when I give talks, I kind of usually start with this, but I give you a little, a, a, a little flavor. And one of the things that, what do you think Elon, what makes Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, people like, what, what, what makes them special? We all, a lot of people work hard. You know, I don't know why on the way up here I saw 100 people working hard on the Oak Road or, you know, working hard at Sheets or anything. What makes them, these people, though, special? Yeah, they're willing to take risks. They're willing to do this. But why? Especially those two. No, that's a good, they do. They pick the people. Anybody else want to take guess? No? I think if you think about it, what makes them special is they did things that they didn't follow the crowd. They innovated. They disrupted. And they had a lot of people telling them, you can't do this. Or even if it's a good idea, you'll never get this done. My goodness, you're going to have to take on the big oil companies. You're going to have to take on the big car companies. You're going to have to take on IBM and Steve Jobs. You're going to you're and everybody in the bleeping world wants to tell them, no, you can't. No, you can't. Don't ever let anybody just get away with telling you, no, you can't. If they say that, you have to follow that up and tell me why. Why do you think we can't? And then, what does that start? It starts the process. 
Because now you see what the other smart people think are your challenge, and now to be able to communicate what you want to do, your process, you can have answers to those challenges. Now, some, some are, I'm not going to say a hope and a prayer, but you don't know, but at least you have a plan, a process, to be able to get over those hurdles. All right? I want to show you this, and then we'll talk about it here. Oh, how do I get this to work? How do I, anybody know the other video works? Is there a keyboard? Oh, that one works. Oops. Anybody know how I can do this? Somebody want to help me? I just, usually, if there's an arrow, you just click on it and it goes. Come on, you're all young kids. Somebody's got to know this. Well, I just need to, if there was a... There, yeah, just click on it. There you go. Back. No, no, no. Hold on. Nope, this way. There he is, yeah. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt from a new in the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat tries to maintain his individuality. but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff. Three of them, please. And uh, this man has apparently been in group. Why did I show that? Well, it is written up there. Yeah, that was a good answer. <laughs> the pressure that the world puts on you to conform and what made Steve Jobs, what makes Elon Musk so brilliant. There's nothing wrong with conforming. We conform to laws. We conform to, you know, social mores, whatever. But we are... We risk every day not having independent thought, okay? The other thing, I went to a Jesuit school, I went to St. Joe's, and they used to teach us that there was a thesis and an antithesis, and you bang them together and you get a synthesis. We live in a day where if you disagree with somebody, it's like a crime. It's not a crime, that's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to have an idea, I'm supposed to, or a belief, and I'm saying, well, tell me, and if you disagree, but then maybe you can come to some type of consensus. This was in the 50s, maybe the 60s, I guess, and it's the same today as it's always been. The pressure that people put on you to conform, to not be different, to not think differently, 
I, ta I, never, I hate this outside the box thought, but that's what it is. You need to think independently. And you then need to communicate in some measure, whether it be writing, whether it be communicating, you need to do that. And if you're in business, it's vitally important. Nobody wants to be the next whatever. You're just second. We love disruptive technologies. We love things. That, every major invention, every, we have three life sciences people with us, they're PhD MDs. We're not going to get better. This virus isn't going to get whacked if we don't have people thinking differently. And going along with the crowd is tough to fight against. But since the beginning of time, that's what people want you to do. And please don't do that. Please. You don't have to be a rabble rouser. But don't be afraid of your independent thought. Now, speaking of which. All right, I'm going to, what time is it? I'm going to open, I, I have just something that I need to let, there, I got 10 minutes, so uh, I have five minutes for this. So does anybody have any questions as far as any of what we went over? Um, some of it is top down, very heavy. Some of it, and I'm, at the end here, I'm going to give you a very singularly tangible thing uh, to do to differentiate yourself and to, make, and to make it good for you, too. Anybody have any questions on any of this? Anybody want to know any names I like? What I think of the markets? Yes, sir. Yep. Well, I mean, well, we're looking at the whole everything. So, you know, we might invest in both. You know, we're going to see them and say, you know, we'd like to come see your company. You're a public company. It's part of their duty to meet with potential investors, or it's called investor relations. And here's the other thing. When, I'm in, when we're there, what I try to encourage our research analysts to do is not just sit there with a pen and pad and take notes. What you need to do is engage in a dialogue and let them know what you're seeing when you're talking to competitors, suppliers, vendors, in their sectors. They then look at that as valuable time for them, that you're, you're, you're giving them a view, an independent view of what's going on in there. So they love meeting with us. Uh, just sitting there taking notes, they'll meet with you, but it's not clear. What you really want to do is encourage some type of conversation where you can impart upon them what you're seeing, why you think this other company's doing well. Maybe they can tell you why they're doing better at that. Um, but it's, we are not the competitors. All right, that would be, that's a good question because we're not the competitors. We're just meeting with the competitors. So, and the idea is, especially in technology, you know, when you meet with a company that has, you know, certain tech and then there's cycles and you can leapfrog them, you know, you want to let people know what we're seeing. Things are moving in the supply chain. They're getting good customers. And then we ask the customers why. So a lot of times, you know, guys up here really don't get that kind of info. And it's very helpful to them. So that's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Quiet group. Maybe I'll catch you with this one. So about 12, 13 years ago, we've had some pretty good fortune at the firm. And uh, my father was a pediatrician. My mom was a nurse. Um, and from very early on, my mother especially was somebody who said, that, you know, you need to give back. You need to take the care of the people that have less than you. We're very fortunate. So as a kid, I did that a lot. Did it through college and did it in my early days. I was, became a national trustee for some large, uh, for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and that was for a particular reason. I was also a national trustee for uh, Boys and Girls Club. When I was a kid, I was a big brother. We used to deliver stuff, and I'm not patting myself on the back. It's what I believe. I believe that you have to do community and community service for lots of reasons. Number one, if you watched, didn't watch the debate, the other day, it was this income inequality that people talked about. Well, there are ways to address it without just taking the people's money away that they have it. Uh, but the thing is, we really should be conscious of that and we should pay attention. And we started the foundation and we were basically a foundation that, uh, because we were fortunate, we would raise money, we do events, and then people come to us all the time for donations. So we had a kitty 
and let's say somebody wanted five thousand dollars for an event we do five thousand or two thousand five hundred from the foundation and twenty five hundred from us so we'd be able to really be able to spread it around a lot better all right and it was going great and but i always wanted to do a little bit more i got very frustrated when i was on these large boards because they never were able to move the ball there was so much politics so much stuff in it. it got to be very frustrating to be honest with you so i always thought if i had our foundation that at some point we would do something important and it would be national i love helping the local community out i always have but our footprint is national so if i would go to somebody in texas and i'm saying hey look our foundation is doing something for this neighbor they'd give you money but it really wasn't there so i really started getting in, in, involved in that area about two and a half three years ago uh, an opportunity came up to buy the old jewish community center if you haven't seen it come by please it's on oregon pike in lancaster um, it's uh, about a 35,000 square foot building uh, it used to be the jcc and it has a gym and a banquet area, a huge kitchen, all kinds of offices and stuff. And we use that for uh, our not-for-profit. So in there now, we give low or no rent to a lot of other not-for-profits. The Girl Scouts are in there. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters are in there. A thing called Rock Steady Boxing that works with Parkinson patients. It's therapy for that. We have a thing called K-Pets. Anybody know, ever heard of K-Pets? K-Pets is where you take your own animal, they teach them how to be a socialization animal, and then they go to nursing homes and schools and whatever. There's pigs, there's ducks, there's dogs, there's everything. Cats, and it's really cool. Uh, we have an autism school that we had upstairs and all kinds of other stuff. But what really got me, and back to why I like disruption, how many, now maybe I'll get hands on this. How many kids in here enjoy playing a video game every once in a while. Oh. And how many people here thought I was a big fan of video games up until three years ago? I wasn't. I had four teenagers, and when I used to pull in the driveway, the dogs would bark, and they put their stuff away. Because I would come in and I'd say, go do something. You know, it's a waste of time. But what do I do for a living? I'm a research analyst. And what I started to see in the real world is the people that I had respect for and people that um, were smart were on the periphery or getting involved in esports. I didn't get it. I thought it was stupid. So what did I do? I do what I always do, but I didn't do it in this case. I started at ground zero. I tried to have no biases whatsoever. That was hard because you already had a bias, right? So to get to zero, it's hard to do, but I did it. And I started to see the tremendous value that esports could provide in many ways. So we, for 100 years, have known the benefits of extracurricular activities, sports, theater, art, music, on education. And there's, you could fill six libraries full of that research. But there was no research at all at least no domestic research for sure, on the positive effects on, or what could be the positive effects of video games and esports on our youth. And I started to work on that. I started to look at STEM. You guys know what STEM is? And esports. Long story short, I ran into, I thought I was, I thought I was killing it. I had my research guys on it. I thought I was a renaissance man. I thought I was doing great. And the Tiger Woods Foundation invited me to come to a, a talk given by somebody they thought was pretty smart on esports and STEM. So I thought, man, I'm going to go there. I'm going to teach them a thing or two. I'll see what they know. Well, I was a piker. I was just a ch I was chump. These guys were unbelievable. And this woman, Dr. Constance Steinkohler, was hired by the Obama administration. And the Obama administration wanted to know why education did so much better uh, outside of our borders and had better outcomes than our own educational system. So they studied it and one of the strong corollaries they found, believe it or not, was this corollary between the kids that did esports and doing well, especially in science, math, and technology. So Dr. Seinkohler was hired by the government and they did 
six years worth of studies, and when they were done, they weren't, Obama's leaving, uh, the Samueli Foundation, which is who I went to go hear speak, the guy started, Mr. Samueli started Broadcom, so his foundation has billions. Mine has $127 in it. But we ended up, after hearing them and seeing that I could not ever compete with them, I wanted to be a partner. So other than talking my wife into marrying me, this was the greatest sales job I ever did in my life. All right? I was able to get them as a full partner. They were the Orange County, California eSports League. And it's very rare for them. They did that in an entrepreneurial way because they're a philanthropic organization and an academic way. They have no business getting it, but they wanted a Petri dish to see if their theories would work. And I got involved at that at a very early level. And then we combined. That was the sales job I did. We are full partners in a thing called the North American Scholastic Esports Federation. And we use this platform of esports at high school level. They're now working at the grade school level. I'm working, I've actually met with your university here, of taking that esports phenomenon, that platform, and infusing some type of structure and education in it. All right? And what we're able to do, all right, is to take these kids who have this passion and put them in a social environment, also with some structure, with their, and their ability to do math, science, all these other things just thrives. Because they're part of a team, it's, it's, and it's totally diverse. <laughs> you can be female, male, black, white, green, it doesn't matter in eSports. Matter of fact, if any of you guys play, you don't even know what the person looks like on the other end when you're playing Fortnite with somebody on, in Hungary, you know? So that's the beauty of this. So we built back to where, what did I have to do? What did I have to do? I started a process. And that process with them was to be able to put this thing together. And now I had to get people. So the woman, Terry Kraft, who you'll see here, was part of the people to execute this plan. Hold on. Take one pass down. 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 Take I'm not, I'm not going to have enough. I thought I went. Yeah. Well, no, won't. It won't. No. All right. This will be, I'm going to skip. If I have time at the end, I'll, you got one? All right. Pass these down, guys.
Here you go. Take one, pass it down. Same up here. <laughs> pass those down. Take one, pass it down. Sometimes in life we make things difficult. We make them complex. We forget about core values and core just common sense things. I often say, you know, what I do for a living isn't rocket science at all. Even though people think, oh, no, it's just hard work. Developing that process, getting the right people, having a common goal, working our asses off, having a, com a competitive spirit to us to want to do well as a fiduciary for our clients. But there's also a competitive thing. We want to kick the people that compete with us their butts. All right, and so we go the extra mile. My office is like Denny's. You don't even need a uh, lock at the door. You know, we have our early crew, our other crew. We have the crew that works 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And it's a culture. It's a team effort. But it's based on some core values. And those core values are hard because I'm as guilty as walking away from these core values as anybody. And if you don't believe me, ask my team. So, but one of the things that I am fairly good at and one of the reasons I believe we sometimes have an advantage that other people don't have is a simple, simple task, all right? By a show of hands, how many people in here in the last month, Christmas was a month or so ago, have written a handwritten note? Wow. You guys are bad. They're good. The most impactful thing you can do in business, in life, in that 10th step communicate is take the 30 seconds it takes to say thank you and to do a handwritten note. Not a bleeping email, not a text, not an Instagram, not a TikTok. I don't even know what that is. My kids tell me that. All right? You don't like this? You're not happy? Okay, good. Where's your thing? All right. So what I want you to do before you leave, it will take you 20 seconds. I want you to write a thank you to whoever you're thankful to, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, somebody that's helped you through school, your teacher, whatever. Just that, thinking of you, I've been thinking of you, this jerk at school made me do this, whatever. Right now, I'm going to take these from you. You're going to seal them, you're going to address them up front, and we're going to send them to whoever you want them to be sent to. I'm picking up the postage. Okay? And then I have one request. One request. Now, I dedicated a lot of time and my money, uh, time to come here and do this for you. I have one simple request. All right? And that is somehow, some way, let me know how this went. Did somebody say something? Was it, was it something that uh, was accepted well? Now, I don't do things willy nilly, I'm a research analyst. So there was a research study done recently, conducted at the University of Texas. And they wanted to find out, and their study was based on, oh, don't take my word on it. Here's the study. You can hand those across. Okay? You can hand those up and down, please. There you go. You can read about it in the whole thing. But they wanted to see this powerful process, they wanted to do research on it. And basically what they said for the recent study, they conducted three different experiments in which study participants wrote various letters expressing gratitude and then predicted how happy or potentially awkward they thought the recipient would be once he or she got that. Their results proved, and I saw in the results, that people express gratitude, they underestimated how grateful the people would be by getting this. 
They're almost stuck, shocked. They're almost stunned. If somebody would take the time to do a handwritten note. You guys are going to do internships. You're going to go do interviews. Take the three minutes it takes. I went to the dollar store last night. It took me a minute and a half to go in there, get these and out. So don't tell me about time. The results said that uh, on the flip side, people who wrote thank you letters were, all, were also felt good about it, and it made them feel good. The researchers found that the procedural gesture of expressing gratitude in a handwritten note boosts their, their positive emotions and well-being for both the letter writer and the letter receiver. This is going to be something that if you get in this practice, will one tangible thing I can give you, if you do this, this will pay monstrous dividends. And I can tell you because I do it, and I can tell you another thing. I am not, I, people think I'm a pack rat, I'm not as bad as my wife. I never, ever, ever throw away a handwritten note that somebody writes me, ever. That's a personal thing. And I get them so infrequently that it's not that much of a problem. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Uh, write your note, put them up here, uh, put the address on the front. They have to have an address. We'll throw them through our meter and we'll send them out. And then somehow somebody can tell I am uh, going to leave a bunch of cards up here. And uh, you can send me an email. Or maybe somebody can write me a handwritten note. All right, there are my cards. Uh, but thank you. I'm sorry I kept you late, but appreciate it.